The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Thank you, Tally Olson. I am back, and you are comfortably zoned with me, the Zigzag Man, in Alameda, California, right across the bay from San Francisco and across the moat from Oakland. I am, as usual, blessed with the presence of some of the most interesting folks on the planet, and that's what I do. I talk to them. Um, Today, I get to talk to a mainstay at the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network about baseball. His name is Jack DeGraw, and not only (laughs) that, (laughs) <laughs> Jack DeGruy, and not <laughs> only that, Jack, you're bringing a guest with you to chat um, first days of spring training. Jack, who's with you? Well, my, my good friend I met in uh, Tampa, Kip uh, Christensen, and Kip was an uh, ex college player, basketball, an ex-professional basketball player, and a wrestler. But the most important thing, he's a Green Bay Packer fan. So we we got a lot to talk about. All right. Well, let me ask you this, Tim, without knowing you. How far back do you go following the Green Bay Packers? Because I'm an old school guy, and I remember Bart Bart Kowski, let alone uh, uh, all of them. Uh, what's your earliest memory of the Packers? Uh, my first game ever was Lynn Dickey's last game. I guess that's where it started for me. Uh, <laughs> James Lawson, John Jefferson, Philip Epps, Paul Coff, uh, Paul Coffey, was it Coffey or Kaufman, um, the tight end. That was where I started. So that would have been early, mid-80s. Um, All right. That was the to... pack is back years. Am I right? Correct. Fourth Greg was the coach. Okay. Now, I remember when Forrest Gregg was a mainstay on that line that um, made the pack great back in the day. Um, So how was he as a coach? Not very good. He didn't last long. You know, those 80 Green Bay Packer teams were not good. Let's be honest. They were not good. And we didn't see signs of life until Don Mikowski uh, took over. Um, the Magic Man, and then Favre took over after that. So that's where it really started. All right. Tell me about yourself. Where did you grow up? I grew up in a small town in River Falls, Wisconsin. Okay. Um, uh, old farm kid. And, yeah, that's Midwestern boy through and through. What was your first baseball experience as a fan? Uh, first baseball experience, uh, unfortunately, because of where I am located, I'm in western Wisconsin, we never got to see the Milwaukee Brewers play. So right. my first baseball experiences were all the Minnesota Twins, which is only, which at that time, you know, it's about 40 minutes away from River Falls, Wisconsin. We're kind of a border town. So, yeah, grew up watching the Minnesota Twins in the Dome. All right. Um, hey, just to get to know you personally a little bit, because it's your first time in the zone, let me ask you a few questions. What did you listen to music-wise when you were growing up? Uh, whatever my brother did, and that was usually bad hair bands of the 80s. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was five years older, so I just followed him. His taste All right, really and cool. what did you read? What was your uh, What was on your bookshelf? Oh. Uh, what did I read? I, first few books I remember reading were Jim McMahon books for the Bears. Okay. You know, so I, sports books. I should probably not admit it, but a bunch of books about serial killers. Uh, Ed Gein and then Gangsters and Al Capone. Yeah. Well, was that, it the serial killers, what, they smother a guy with Wheaties or what? <laughs> hey, Ed Gein's from this area. He's from Wisconsin, so he, you know, he made a few people into furniture. So, oh, okay. I, I, certainly I found that interesting. <laughs> well, everybody, everybody has an art, and everybody's good at something. You got. <laughs> yeah, he had a craft. That's working sure. with, 
you have people working with their hands and their imagination. You got to give them credit for that, if not being a sociopathic killer. Um, I never really thought of him. He's an artist. Yes, yeah. Credit, credit where credit is due. How'd you get into the? How'd you get into playing ball? What was your inspiration? Um, who coached you? Uh, wh- what were your favorite sports? Uh, you know, my favorite sports growing up was actually golf and basketball. Um, but what got me into basketball more than anything was I just I ended up being seven feet tall and. Um, when I graduated high school, I was only about six, seven, 180 pounds. And then after one year of college, I grew to six, eleven, and 240 pounds. Whoa! So that and really you cannot you cannot coach height or speed. No, you can't. No, you cannot. Okay. And 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 uh, when that happened, I, you know, I figured, well, I have this height. I better I better give it a go. And that's how I got into basketball. Okay, who was your mentor? Who was your early coach in basketball? Uh, early coach mentor would probably be my college coach, Coach Jim Smith, who was a, you know, a legend in Minnesota. I think the all-time wins leader um, in this area for uh, wins. Um, you know, he kind of, you know, kind of brought me along and, you know, taught me the game, you know, the best okay. that he could. And then from there on, you know, in which I ended up having a decent college career. You know, well enough. You know, good enough to get invited to camps after college. Um, and then after that, it was kind of you know a guy named Paul McKesky, who played for the Bucks. Oh, I remember that found, name. Yeah, yeah, he found me and just kind of put me under his wing and kind of groomed me. And then I, you know, then I had an agent that played you know basketball named John Gregg, who played for the Sonics. And then obviously then being an agent for you know guys like you know Boogie Cousins, things like that. Right. And then you know. Then I just started being around the right people, and they basically trained me into being, you know, the pro player that I ended up being. What was what was your strength as a pro player, and what was would you say was your weakness? Uh, let's see, the strength. Was, my strength would not even be allowed today. <laughs> my strength actually in the game was I was kind of I want to say a goon, but I was the guy that was out there, you know. <laughs> Rebounding, saying hard screens, beating up on people. You know what I mean? Those guys that used to have to go guard Shaq and those kind of guys. That that was kind of uh, my game. You know, it was an right. aggressive game. I mean, that was back in the day. I mean, the Knicks had, you know, what was it? Uh, Larry Johnson, J.R. Reed. You know, the game was way more physical then. I, they would not even allow that now. So, right. and then my um, weaknesses. Yeah. Uh, weaknesses. In some ways, my head. <laughs> Um, just, yeah, I, you know, I, I was a great shooter, but I wasn't always the most confident shooter all the time. Um, but, you know, and then, you know, you know, I was carrying seven feet and playing professional level at about 270 pounds. So I guess you probably say my foot speed at times is probably a little slow, but you know, those have been my weaknesses. Okay. Um, what was your biggest thrill as a professional? Biggest thrill as a professional. You know, it's a good. It's a really good question. You know, I would actually say I was playing over in China, and this is you know the year that Yao Ming actually just started playing in the United States. So while I'd been used to playing in front of large crowds, you know, you know, as a professional, but what you what was going on in China at that time was absolutely amazing every gym that we went into would be sold out um the crowds were you know electric and you know you get done with the game and you have you felt like a backstreet boy you would go to the bus and there would be you know a thousand people chasing after you just to get autographs you know wow you just see the, the the globalization of basketball in china to me was you know, the most amazing thrilling thing that i that i saw as a professional yeah i mean i've we won, you know, big tournaments and things like that. And, you know, we had, I've had some success, in, you know, as an individual. But that, to me, was amazing. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, we've left somebody out of this interview. And what I'd like to do is, is have Jack ask you questions that um, <laughs> would, 
would fit the bill more because he knows more about you. And um, Jack DeGraw, take over for me a little bit. Um, no, th- th- that's will. all right, right, Ralph. Kip's the star, the star of the show. I get enough chance to talk. I- I'd like to ask you, Kip, about your time at uh, Arizona State. Oh, with Bill Frieder there? Uh, yes. Yeah, uh, I was only there, you know, the one year, and I was a walk-on, and I hardly even practiced with the team. I, I truly believe they they used my grades <laughs> for the team because that was the year that I think – what did they have? I don't know how many people got kicked off that team, but everybody had basically <laughs> some kind of criminal charges against them. Um, God, was that – I don't know if you remember the name of uh, Headache Smith, Steve, Stephen Headache Smith, Jamal Faulkner, Dwayne Fontana. Oh, man. Mario Bennett, he was on that team. Fantastic player. I think he played for the Suns for a few years. Uh, yeah, it was just a group of knuckleheads. Um, there. You didn't, you, didn't, you didn't get much of a chance to practice with the team. No, I I was you know I'm six foot you know, well I just I was just growing and filling out. They're basically like you're not ever going to play here unless you go to JUCO, you know. So that's why I basically had to transfer out and go play basketball somewhere else. Well, didn't didn't you grow like three or four inches over that uh, over that year? Yeah. Four inches and gained, was it, I think it was 60 pounds. Yeah. Wow. When I started college, I was 17 years old. I was the youngest kid in my class in high school by a long shot. So, yeah, I was 17 years old living on my own at, at Arizona State. I'm going to interrupt you. If, you weren't, if it weren't for sports, what would be your passion? What would, how would your life have gone? Um, you know, that's a great, that's an interesting question. You know, I always wanted to be a psychiatrist. So, you know, going through college, I did end up getting my pre-med requirements and, you know, I had a psychology degree. So ultimately I wanted to be a psychiatrist, but, you know, with the opportunity that I had with sports, you know, I, I, that kind of went to the wayside. Okay. Um, and my only other question, what was the adjustment like after you stopped playing ball, both um, mentally and physically? How did you uh, get that competitive thing going, which it takes to be a world-class athlete, and that can't just turn that off? Um, how, did you, um, how did you take that uh, competitive that spirit? That was hard. That was hard. Okay, um, I imagine so. That was hard. You know what? What, what I when I get when I was finally done with basketball, I I got into coaching. I think that's usually a lot of what a lot of former players do. Right. So I got into coaching for a few years. Um, end up being the president, um, kind of slash GM of the Yakima Sun Kings in the CBA. Um, wow. And I was working with Paul Wolpert and. You know, CBA at that time was dying compared to, like, the G League. Or the, it was, you know, I think at that time it was called the D League. Um, so there was only a few teams. But we had a really solid team there. And I got fired at the end of the year from there. And I, that, that left me with nothing um, in the coaching world at that time. So, you know, what I did to – be competitive and you know fill that void was you know I got lucky enough to be discovered by the WWE and they signed me and I got into wrestling. I mean that's kind of how it went. Well, well now yeah. what's the what was the adjustment into wrestling athletically? The, oh what's the training like? <laughs> uh, how does it differ from uh, the traditional basketball, football training? This, that, and the other thing. I mean, different worlds, different worlds. I mean, basketball practices, especially when you play in Europe, you know, I played in Eastern Europe and, you know, China and those areas. Basketball practices were hard. I mean, they were conditioning. You're running all day long, sprint, 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 two practices a day. You know, then when you get into wrestling, 
well, A, you're an entertainer, but B, the practices are like you're going through a car crash every day. So as it, it, it has nothing to do with being like, what I would call fit, you know, being able to run, move, jump, be agile. It was more of like how much pounding can your body take, you know, falling on the mat, learning how to fall correctly, you know, taking, you know, missed punches and, you know, moves that go bad, you know. Right. It, it, it's just, it's just, it's apples to oranges when it comes to what your body goes through. Were you billed as the good guy or the bad guy? If there's still that uh, type of, I, when I first started, I was, I was, I was a heel. I was, you know, what you guys would be called the bad guy. Okay. Um, but you know, you switch. They, they they do ask you to switch things up. You know, every once in a while, you know, you'll be the you know the baby face, which is called you know the good guy. Um, right. But, you know, sometimes when you're a really, really good heel, like a really good bad guy, people actually start to like you, you know. It, you know, I don't know how to explain that phenomenon, but, you know, you become such a bad guy, people find you fairly entertaining, and they actually like seeing you. So, um, you know, I, I did both. I was, I was the good and the bad guy. What was it like with your fellow companions uh, competi- with your competitors and fellow entertainers, was it mellow or were there um, was it uh, copacetic between you when you practiced and, and all of this? Um, did every nobody wanted to see anybody get hurt? I'm sure. Right, you're all there to protect each other. That's that's rule number one because you okay. make your living off being healthy. Because you if you can't wrestle, you don't get paid. Um, and everybody so, respects that in the other in the other wrestlers. Am I correct? Generally, yeah. I mean, I was generally, yeah. Ninety percent of all the guys are really good guys. To be honest with you, most of those wrestlers are really good guys. You know, they have you know personas and characters. Which, you know, hey, they're not that great a human being. Nah, most of them are good guys. They're a couple knuckleheads. But who, you know, who took the time when you first when you first transferred from basketball and to wrestling? Who took the time to help you the most? Uh, I was trained by Steve Kern and Dr. Tom Pritchard. Um, they were the head of the schools there. Um, Norman Smiley was there at the time. Billy Kidman, um, Joey Mercury. I mean, this is a, you know, these are some, I mean, they were, they were superstars in wrestling. Um, not mm-hmm. huge names, but all um, valuable carpenters in the business, you know. Um, okay. So, you know, Did... they kind of groom, they, they teach you everything, groom you. And then a lot of the other stuff, you just work with the other guys. And a lot of the other guys were coming from, families with a long history tradition of wrestling. So, you know, you have the DiBiase's, you'd have the Rotundas, um, you know, you know, Roman Reigns, the current, you know, you know, WWE superstar, uh, you know, he, his lineage is, you know, you know, it was his father. And I don't, I don't know all his uncle. I mean, they're all, you know, great wrestlers. So you, you, you learn from all the other guys as well. The Hennings, um, yeah, I mean, they were all there, Steamboat. All those kids were there as well. When you look back upon it, did you enjoy that experience or the experience of basketball overall more? Wow. I, you know, so different. I, I, you know, at the end, I really loved wrestling and the entertainment aspect. That was fun. But I... I Basketball took me so many places in life. You know, I saw the world because of basketball. You know, I got paid mm-hmm. to play a game I love to play. So, truthfully, you know, and today, you know, I got back into coaching just this year again. So, uh, you know, basketball was obviously my I, – I think it would still be my favorite experience of the two, for sure. Okay. Um, what do you miss most about wrestling now that you're not doing it? Uh it's a weird thing, but I, I kind of miss the guys in the road, you know? I mean, you're never home. I mean, you're, you are a circus, you know, 
you're gone all the time. And you kind of miss the camaraderie with the guys, you know, you, you know, you get done with a match at 11, you know, you, you basically go to the car, you have to drive four hours or three hours to the next city, you know, I don't know. There's a certain camaraderie you get with the guys when you're, when you're doing that day in and day out, you know, that, that's what I miss about the wrestling, but the entertainment aspect's fun too, you know, to have a whole, you know, arena hate you or love you. That's a pretty cool experience. Right. You know, to, you know, that you are basically toying with their emotions, you know, to, to evoke an emotion out of them. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty cool phenomenon. Tell me about the fans. Um, are the fans more fanatic than you would have imagined them to be? Yeah, um, definitely. You know, I got into wrestling not knowing a lot about wrestling. I mean, I grew up watching some. But when I was playing basketball, I was 100%, you know, 100% committed to what I was doing. So I didn't – I really had no idea what was going on around me and, you know, outside world, you know, wrestling and this and that. So I, I wasn't aware of what wrestling was really like or about. And I, I was shocked at the, you know, the fanaticism of wrestling fans. I mean, they know everything. They know all the moves. They know – every wrestler for the last 20 years from whatever territory or development, you know, wrestling, you know, territory was around. So um, it's a definitely an interesting breed or group of people that um, follow wrestling, in my opinion. Tell me about some of the superstar wrestlers that you met. Um, well, we, we would train out of John Cena's gym because he, you know, he resides down in Florida in that Tampa area. So we all, that was where we did all our weight training and working out. Um, and then, you know, we'd have, you know, I, I don't know if you know some of these wrestlers yourself, but, like, we'd have, you know, CM Punk, um, The Edge, um, Undertaker, Fit Finley. Those guys would be coming in to, you know, help us, critique us with matches and things like that as we were, you know, preparing to be brought up in, onto the road. Who were the good coaches who who helped you a lot with technique and what have you? Um, one of the guys that really helped me a lot, you know, unfortunately he wasn't a full time instructor, uh, was one of the members from um, the Road Warriors. Um, what was it Hawk? I, I can confuse Hawk or Animal. One of them unfortunately passed away, but it was. He, he he taught me how to wrestle like a big guy. So he taught me a lot of, you know, technique of how to, you know, perform as a big man in the ring. Hey, excuse me. I small. think I have a surprise. I have a surprise for Jack. We're joined by Mark Littell, a friend of Jack's and um, former baseball player, coach, renaissance man. How you doing, Mark? Well, I'll give you a renaissance man, but it's Jerry Feidelberg instead. Oh, okay. Well, I, <laughs> Jerry Feidelberg, um, you joined, you know Jack DeGraw from our, our network, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. If not. I, I, thought, we, I thought we were on uh, schedule for noon with Michael Duca, but I can I can call back. Well, why don't you hang around a little bit and join the conversation? Jerry is a, um, a former pharmacist. He's a, he's the um, pharmacist of the year in California, 1995. He's also a press box. Um, uh, um, press box. Um, a member of the Press Box show on our network. You are um, Jerry Feidelberg, who um, covers the Warriors, the A's, and the um, and the Seals, the or the, the hockey team in Northern California. I'm awful blustered here because I didn't expect to have you. Um, uh, Jack, introduce your guest on this show to Jerry. 
if you will. Hey, how you doing, Jerry? I, I'd like to meet I'm my, uh, all my, good, impromptu, my good... All impromptu on the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. <laughs> Jerry, bear hey, with hey, us. Jerry. Jack. Jack. I'd like you to meet my Jack. good friend, uh, Kip Christensen, who is a professional basketball player and, uh, and a pro wrestler. And now he's coaching high oh, school okay, basketball. Yeah. Yeah, I'm doing, doing, Jerry. I'm doing. Hi, guys. Uh, tonight I'm doing the uh, Stanford Arizona State uh, basketball game over at Maples Pavilion here in uh, Palo Alto. Yeah. Jerry has become a journalist in his second career, and he is incre- he has a history um, goes back to Boston, a history of being a sports fanatic. And um, this conversation may interest you because um, the, um, there were two sports involved, basketball and, um, and wrestling. And um, it's fascinating for me to talk to somebody who has made a uh, – a change in career in midlife, and I think it acquaint, um, there's an analogy to your change in midlife. Um, how does, Jerry, I'm going to draw on you for a second. How does the ability to adapt and change serve you in life? Um, it, and uh, how did you go from one career to another. Well, I had my own business for many years in in our in our hometown of Alameda, Ralph. You know where that is. You've right, been, I you've do. You've been around a few times. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but what happened to me was that I, I never dreamed that I would be doing sports uh, as I'm doing now uh, about uh, – 27 years ago, oh, more than that, almost almost 30 years ago, when I had the store, the uh, the, tra- the train the trainer for the Oakland Athletics, fellow by the name of Barry Weinberg, came into my store. My store, as you know, Alameda is not very far from the, where the A's play, and uh, Weinberg was having lunch across the street. And he came into the store, and he said, "How'd you like to work with the A's?" I said, "How soon? And what do I have to do?" So I had a I had a submit a bid for uh, whatever the team uses, and um, just before the start of the '93 season, I got a call and said, "We'd like you to come on board." And I was with the A's for a number of years, made a lot of contact, and when I retired, I was able to parlay that into a sports writing career. Okay. Now my point was, you were open to change, and you said. How do I do it? Where do I go? What was the change like for you, Tim? What was, what was the change like for him? In, in other oh, words, no, from... when you were faced with, when you were given the opportunity to change careers, was it instantaneously, wow, I'll do it, or did it take take a while? You know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. I don't feel like I, I I did it instantly, but it was tough. I mean, I, I was legitimately scared moving from you know the basketball world, which I knew well, you know, you know even in the coaching world, you know, the playing world, doing the coaching world, basketball. I mean, something I knew, I knew the game. But then you also know, go into the wrestling world. I had no clue. I had no no clue what I was getting into. But you know, I, I just thought it was an opportunity, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity, so I took it. You know. I, I was definitely scared doing it, but, you know, you know it's something that had to be done in my opinion. Okay. Jack, take over a little bit. Oh, okay, uh, Kip, I, I'd like to ask you about, you were telling me a story when you were playing in China, and the U.S. team was ahead by 30 points. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, was I remember so the long. story. It's a great story. I wish you would tell it. Oh, my Lord. Yeah, so it was, I don't know, the 2003, 2004. You know, I was playing in the D League with Charles, you know, South Charleston. It was the Low Gators. And we formed this D League All-Star team where we got to go tour China 
um, for the summer and play, I think it was 12 or 15 games. And, you know, they were going to pay us pretty decent, you know, amount of money to go play these exhibition games against Chinese teams. So we get over there, and it's, you know, a bunch of D-League all-stars. Everybody's a very good player. And then we also have a guy named Cedric Savalas. I don't know if you guys remember that name in NBA world. He was a, he was a great player. Champion. Great yes, player. Was. Yeah, I, th- I think he put up 60 for the Lakers at one point. Like, he, he was – he scored 60 points in an NBA game. You could play out play. Um, so we're playing this um, – you know, we're probably about four or five games into this exhibition, and, we, you know, we're beating up on these Chinese teams pretty good. And then we get to this one game, and I wish I could remember where it was. I just remember it was somewhere in the Chinese province of coming. And um, we're up – we're just beating on this team, just beating on beating on beating on them. And we get to halftime, and, I, yeah, like Jack said, we're up around 30. Also, the second half starts, and – we are literally getting mugged on every play, and the refs aren't blowing a whistle, not one time. Although when China, the Chinese team would get the ball, they would if we breathed on them, they're getting a foul call. And it's just happening over and over again. Also, before you know it, you know, the game's down to like 15 points. All of a sudden, you know, it's still getting everything, and everything's getting a little chippier, and now it's down to like 10 points. So finally we have a guy that just, you know, we, we see what's going on now. I mean, it's. You know, the refs, I mean, this is blatant. They're trying to get China back into the game and give them the win. You know, and that does happen over there and sometimes happens in Europe as well. Um, So we get this point guard who decides that, you know what, I'm a pretty good shooter. So he would basically get across half court and just start launching them. And so he makes, like, three in a row. So we'll probably get the lead back up to, like, 20. And we have, like, you know, maybe two minutes left to go in the game. And in the infinite wisdom of our team captain, Cedric Savalas, who basically the whole game is saying, hey, everybody, be mellow, be mellow, be mellow. He decides to then hold up his USA jersey to the crowd and start pointing at it while this game's been, you know, chippy the last 10 minutes of the game. So before you know it, we have water bottles and God knows what could be thrown coming down, raining onto our heads with two minutes left in the game. And, I mean, it was a mad dash to the exit. We never finished the game. We got to the bus. The, the crowd not only just kept throwing stuff in the arena and rioting, they then followed us out to the bus and started shaking the bus. And we all – it was a pretty scary moment. They didn't break any of the windows or anything like that. But, you know, they just didn't want us around anymore. And, well, needless to say, I think we had, like, six more games in the tour. And we were sent packing home. They canceled our whole trip, and we sat in a hotel for a couple of days while they got our, you know, everything prepared for us, and they sent us home immediately. And we never got to finish our tour of China that summer. So, yeah, Cedric Saval just decided to, you know, hold up his jersey and point to the whole crowd. You know, while I think he's right. standing on our bench while he was doing it too. <laughs> hey, yeah. um, Jerry, I wanted to remind you that we're, we were on for three, and that was the that was the mistake. If um, if you can um, get back with us at three, it would be great. Oh, that'd be great. I'll sign off, and uh, nice talking with you, Jack and Tim. And uh, I'll be talking to you uh, at three o'clock. All right. Bye Sorry for my you, confusion. And, um, no problem. Um, appreciate it. And uh, that's Jerry Feidelberg. And um, we'll see you at 3, Jerry, on um, press, Bay Area Press Box in the Zone, Comfortably Zoned you Radio Network. And um, thank you again for everything. Um, Jack, how did you guys meet? How did you and Tim meet? Well, it's Kip, bro. <laughs> Kip, no, I'm Kip sorry. and me, uh, we we <laughs> met at a we we Kip met at a gym bro. at Tampa, Florida. And you know, I was out there shooting, and I seen this big guy, and he come out here and there. He started to shoot, and we just you know uh, started to talk about basketball. Yeah. And, and Kip's a Minnesota Twins fan. And I remember we played tennis, and you know, we went to like Yankee spring training games. 
Yep. And to my surprise, we, I went to a Tampa Yankee game, and there was this big guy on the field who threw out the first ball, and <laughs> they said, oh, he, he liked Cottonwood. He's a wrestler. And I go, I known Kip for six months. I never knew he was a wrestler. I think you'd be interested, Ralph, if Kip would tell you the story. He was actually on TV as a wrestler. Oh. Eli Cottonwood. Could you, you mind telling the story, Kip? <laughs> yeah, I don't talk about that much. But yeah, yeah. When I got into wrestling, I was pulled part of the WWE and you know the Vince McMahon circus. So, yeah, I, you know, after the years of training at the WWE, they put me on the road, and yeah, I was on TV as. Eli Cottonwood in the WWE. Now, how, who named you Eli Cottonwood? Dusty Rhodes did. Um, I don't know if you remember that name in wrestling, but Dusty Rhodes was our creative director. So, okay. yeah, he – and it was – I don't know where he got the Eli from, but I know the Cottonwood was from the was a Cottonwood Santa – Cottonwood Sanitarium or something like that. In like Michigan, I know that you know the because my first character that I, when I started in wrestling was basically uh, insane giant. <laughs> you had fun. Yeah. I can tell by the by your voice <laughs> that you were having fun with this, and I mean you're no dummy. You're a pre med uh, type student. Um, you had to look at this with tongue in cheek a bit, did you not? Oh. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I Did like you I have fun with those who took it too seriously? What's that? Did you have fun with those who took it too seriously? With uh, those, you know, the I mean, whole no, thing. I mean, in the wrestling business, everybody's a character. You know, you know, it, you know. Friends and family may not have understood the life choice, but, you know, all the guys we were working with on a daily basis, they're characters. So it wasn't that difficult. Okay. All right. It, it wasn't anything. There weren't the ego. It wasn't the ego thing that it's built to be. In other words, um, people get by that. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, it's not as it's not as ego driven as you'd think. I mean, majority of all the guys backstage are good friends, and everybody has you know they all have families, they all have you know mortgages to pay. So everybody really protects each other. You know, it's it's a business. You're all entertainers. You're there to do a job. Um, you know, yeah, some want to get to the you know top of the totem pole quicker, but you know those things will sort themselves out, and it's not up to them. It's up to the creative writing the stories. So. You know, okay. I think everybody just kind of has a, you know, hold the line. What's it like on the road? Did they take care of you as, as um, do you have to make your own accommodations or uh, they do it, it as, does, as a team? It depends on the contract that you were on. At, the, you know, at least I'm just speaking from what I know back then. At, at that time, it was depending on the contract you were on. I was on like a basically initial contract, so they took care of um, our airfare, which I think they take care of all the guys' airfare, but then um, they took care of my house or my hotels and rental car. But once you're off that initial contract, um, those guys are they have to uh, they have to do all their own hotel accommodations and rental car accommodations and all that. I think they do get flown to and from wherever they're going, but they have, okay. they have to pay for their hotels and rental cars. Is there some sort of security in in terms of uh, being paid, um, uh, hospitalization? Um, you are benefit? covered. Yeah, yeah, I'm just obviously I'm just still going off what I know. Um, at that time, you were covered for any in ring injury, anything that you were doing while working, you were covered, hundred um, percent. I mean, really good health okay. insurance by the WWE. But if you if you were sick outside of the ring, got injured outside of the ring, that you're on your own there. Um, and if you get injured, um, most I, I I would assume almost all the contracts had a downside. So you 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 you're a salary, you know, very low salary, and then depending on how much you're on TV or what you're doing, you know, how many nights a week you're working, then you get paid extra. But if you're at home with an injury, 
for eight months, you know, because you tore your shoulder out or whatever, you probably are just only going to get paid your downside for the year, your downside salary. Okay. So would you recommend it to a kid? If you had a kid or a nephew, would you recommend it to them? No. But, okay. you know, I, I you know, I, it, the lifestyle is crazy. I mean, it's late nights. It's hard work. It's all day long. And I don't know where you go from it. I mean, you, you only have a, you know, you can only do it for so long. I, I just don't know. I mean, I guess it's like asking football players would they tell their kids, you know, allow their kids to play football at NFL level anymore. I, I don't know, you know. Yeah, the money would be okay. great. Maybe they can set themselves up for something. But uh, the tear on the body and the things you have to do, it's a tough life. Yeah. Tough lifestyle. Have you considered writing a book about your experience? No, because I prefer to make money, and I don't think that would. <laughs> okay. I don't think, you know, my life seems pretty interesting, but I, I don't think it would sell. So, uh, yeah. All right. Nah, I haven't thought about it. All right. Jack, I'm going to turn it over to you for the 11th time. I got a big mouth. (laughs) No, that's all right, Ralph. The big thing is Kip's on the show. I'm so glad he's here. I I remember down in Tampa, didn't you have like a a broken hand for like a half a year or so? Yeah. uh, Well, I severed my radial nerve, so my whole – uh, was it from my was from my elbow down to my fingertips was paralyzed. Um, on my wait, was it my left? Oh my god, I have to check my scars right now. Just even look. <laughs> yeah, well, it was my left. Yeah, it was my left. I severed my radial um, nerve in a in a match with Biggie Langston, and uh, yeah, and instantly lost all feeling in my arm. I actually thought I broke my arm in the ring. Is what I thought happened. Um, so yeah, we, we were on, it was actually a TV match in Florida developmental, you know, wrestling or in the FCW. And we had a, you know, a couple more minutes of the match. We had to try to finish a match with, you know, my arm just dangling at its side. So, yeah. So yeah, that, that was, it took some good amount of time to get that thing fixed. Um, they, you know, the WWE sent me multiple places, you know, they shipped me to Pittsburgh and, you know, I couldn't tell you how many tests I had done on my arm to figure out what, you know, what happened, the nerve damage and this and that. But finally they found the right doctor who could perform this, you know, I won't say experimental surgery, but he gave me a tendon transfer where they took the tendons from the bottom part of my arm and reattached them to the top part of my hand and gave me like movement and mobility back in that arm. So, yeah, it was, that was a scary, scary in, injury. Cause yeah, I was paralyzed in that arm for you know many months. Wow. Um, still can't shoot. You know, uh, the one thing that really stinks about that is, you know, I'm left-handed, so, I, lo- you know, I love shooting the, you know, like, I don't know if you've ever seen Jack shoot the basketball, but, my God, the guy never misses. Um, I, I've seen YouTube tapes of him. I'm uh, absolutely amazed. What's your amazing. record, Jack? Not what, to toot uh, your own horn, but toot your own oh, horn. Uh, no, I, no, I had 628 in a row. Was it free throws or threes? Free- uh, free throws. The most threes I ever had in a row was 154. And actually today I had 161 shots in a row. 120 you foul shots and 41 free throw, uh, three, th- uh, three pointers. Well, to me, that's you most do this every have. day of your life. Am I right, Jack? Oh yeah. You know, I, I, I was afraid I was going to miss the show, but I said, I, I got to shoot first. I, I knew Kip would understand if I was late, but fortunately I wasn't oh, yeah. late. Okay. Jack, what are your what are your what are your thoughts when you're shooting? I, I have to know this because I, I want to teach this to my kids. You know, I was a really good shooter. I remember going through practice without missing. You know, but I've never done what you've done, not even close. You know, I, what are your, your your shot thoughts? Well, well, the thing is, it, it, it's it's concentration, and what I always try to do is I'm always playing like games with myself. You know, like mm-hmm. how many in a row, how many am I going to make out of 100? You know, okay. I used to have a game, I had to make 300 shots before I missed 10 shots. Or like, you know, I, I, I always do that. Like how many three-pointers can I make in an hour? You know, okay. and, and I remember doing it, 
it used to be like, you know, it got to 50 out of 100, 60, and then it got to like 100. Then you just, it, it's always like a constant, you know, uh, it's just concentration is what it is. So you're always trying to like improve and that, and that's, what, <laughs> and that's it. But do you ever get like, okay, it's like, I would, I'd pull the analogy, like, you know, breaking down a wall, like, you know, in golf, someone gets four under also and they get nervous because, Hey, they're not comfortable getting to six under. Do you get nervous once you start making so many shots? Like at some point you're like, Oh my God, I can't believe I made this many shots. Does it then change your, your I guess no, your mentality? No, what happens? Like what what happens is it's almost like you're you're in a zone, like you get in a zone where you you like you you just can't miss miss because everything is just perfect. You know your feet is uh-huh. my feet is perfect, the elbow it, and it, and, it, and it's almost like you're outside your body, like you're 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 like looking down on yourself and saying, boy, this this really can't be real. This is like ridiculous. <laughs> So you said it was 610 free throws and a hundred, was it a hundred? Uh, six, 628 Kip. And I might even had more, but they were getting ready to play volleyball. But see, one of the reasons is they're not actually free throws. I mean, I go back to the foul line. When we used to play basketball, we didn't take the ball out at the three point line because there was no three point line. We used to take mm-hmm. the ball out at the, at the, you know, the foul line. So, you know, that's how I got, you know, going back real quick and shooting the ball because that's where we used to take the ball out from. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. It's amazing. You, I, I, I've never it, seen anything like it. It's, it's just fun to watch. How far did you get in um, your career as a basketball player, Jack? Did, oh, I mean, it, 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 was, it was just like, you know, I, I just stayed basically around my hometown and stuff. I mean, I had chances to go to colleges and stuff like that. But, you know, my dad died when he was my, uh, when I was like a year and a half old. So I had to stay with my mom and my grandmother and stuff like that. So, I mean, there's no regrets. I mean, I had a great time, a great life, but it would have been nice to see what, you know, what, what could have happened. Absolutely. You're the best shooter I've ever seen in my day, in my life, and you know, and you know, that's, I, I've played that's, with guys such as Del Curry and those guys, and you know, Dale Ellis, and you know, they're three point, they were sharpshooters, and I've never seen someone who could fill the basket like you, Jack. Well, I appreciate that, Kip, and, and you know, you know what the great thing is? I mean, like the people who know you know, who are really accomplished and know what it takes to be good at something, they appreciate it more. And, and what happens is I, when I ha- I've had a lot of pro athletes come up to me and compliment me, and it really means a lot because they know what it takes. And, the, yeah, you know, it, the, because the, the thing is the guy, the, guy, the guy on the street has no idea when a guy reaches a pinnacle like a pro how good he is. The worst pro is a thousand times better than you know, like a guy playing in high school, they have no idea any sport. It's, it's amazing to watch. Agree. You know, uh, I'm going to. Uh, I'll tell you something. When I'm 10 years old, Neil Silver was a Dodger fan, and I was a Giant fan, and Jackie Robinson was playing his last few years, and I was 10 years old. I said. Jackie Robinson's all washed up, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I'm hearing these things from older kids. And Neil Silver says to me, he's better now than you'll ever be in your life. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was a lesson. Naturally, he was. <laughs> but um, that, uh, the idea that of not respecting Anyone, any world class athlete who is like you say, the worst basketball player in the pros is an incredible athlete. <laughs> when you th- think about how we rate the, we rate these guys compared to other guys, isn't the the question? We should rate them how they compare to the normal guy on the street, the kid playing well, a pickup game. Well, see, that, that's the thing, Ralph. Any sport. Uh, the mm-hmm. worst professional baseball player in the world 
is a hundred times better than you know. Many people play a sport. Few people are players, and that's the big difference. Yep. Right. Yep. That's, that's a good point. I mean, I always like you look at the NFL. I mean, you get these guys. Oh, he's a terrible player. He's a terrible cornerback. Well, that cornerback was still two-time All AEC, AEC, you know, player. In, you know, in at Alabama. You know, everybody's going there with accolades and accomplishments. Well, whether how they stack up at the pro level is a different story, but. They are all elite players. Okay. Well, uh, I'll give you – Just I'll give you – you know, there was this guy he played down here. He was a first-round pick. He never got out of A-ball. He was a first-round pick for the Cubs, and he played for the Yankees. And then the next year, he's a starting safety for Alabama football team. Brendan wow. Whedon was one of the top picks for the Yankees. He never made it in yeah. baseball. He started quarterback for the Cleveland Browns. So, I mean, people have no idea how good these guys are. It's absolutely incredible. When we were up at the gym, Kip, I mean, these guys from the Rays would come in, you know, baseball players, and they could shoot a basketball, and they could play tennis, and they could throw a football. It was just incredible. And, you know, I get pissed off when they put somebody down because they have no idea how good these guys are. Absolutely. You know who comes Absolutely. to mind when you say that was John Elway, who was a, a Yankee minor leaguer for um, for a year or two, and went on to be John Elway football player. Yeah. So Russell Wilson, I mean Danny Ainge, all those guys. Oh yeah, Danny Ainge was um, ferocious. Toronto, <laughs> uh, you talk yeah, about a Toronto hustler. Blue Jays. Yeah, he just he was amazing shooter. Yes, yeah. Well, he was, well, no, was, Jack a, DeGra- he was no Jack DeGraw. But, but no, there was a was famous no re- wrestler, Randy <laughs> Poffo, and I think he was the Macho Man or something. It was something crazy. Uh, Clark Gillies, the the great hockey player, was a minor league baseball player. Yeah. Uh, before you guys' time, there was um, DeBusher, who played Major League Baseball um, with the White Sox and led the Knicks to a, a championship in 1968. Well, so. to, to give you an idea, guys, how good DeBusher was, the White Sox had a, ch- a choice between Dave DeBusher and Denny McLean, and they, cho- they chose Dave DeBusher. Well. Well, they made the right choice if we're talking about a human being. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, like, uh, yeah. <laughs> am I right? <laughs> yeah. Um, that aside, uh, Denny, uh, you made some mistakes. We all do. Uh, what can I say? You know, this has been a terrific show. I don't want you guys to hang up. I'm going to sign off. I want you to I, – I have something to talk to both of you about. But um, you're going to be back, Skip. I know that. And um, really appreciate your given time to the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. And um, I hope this continues. It'll be, it was a good time, bud. It was a good time. All right. I'll do it again. Um, hang on. I'm – going to sign off and push a button to do so it is the comfortably zoned radio network jack DeGraw was supposed to be the host he ends up <laughs> as just another guy i'm sorry i have such a big mouth <laughs> but um i hope i uh, i will find a way to make it up to you my friend if uh, if this um if this thing can get off the air, we'll talk about it. Thank you for listening, everybody. I'm Ralph Tycho, Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. This has been fun. Adios. Thanks. The proceeding has been a Comfortably Zoned Network production. You are advised to keep your dreams wet, your humor dry, 
your children and grandchildren out of military recruiting offices and off the laps of clerics who wear dresses. Thank you for listening, everyone. Happy trails.